The views and opinions of this program are those of the hosts, guests, and callers. There is substantial risk of loss in trading futures and options, which you should carefully consider prior to trading. Make sure to subscribe to the Market Talk YouTube channel. You can watch our latest interviews with top market analysts in the country, find bonus content, and much more. It's easy. Just go to youtube.com slash at Market Talk Egg and hit the subscribe button. Or you can search for Market Talk Egg on YouTube. Well, as we settled up the trade action on Wednesday, the soy complex, no doubt, was the loser of the session. Corded wheat did their best to try and hang on to some green, but largely slipped a little bit lower as well. Livestock trade was a mixed bag on Wednesday. Here to talk about what we're seeing in these markets, joining us for a conversation, Mike Zuzalo with Global Commodity Analytics. Mike, Good to talk with you. Thanks for joining us. I know we have uh, plenty to dive into here in terms of these markets and uh, an interesting session on Wednesday. I think to one degree, there's still some spillover from all those USDA numbers that came out on Friday. Throw that with uh, looking at South American weather. That seems to be the big things to me anyway, driving these markets here on Wednesday. Yeah. And, you know, Tuesday night, we saw a lot of Chinese economic data come across the screens, Jesse, and we were actually trading up, I think, five to seven in the soybeans at that point. And that economic data came through and most of it was pretty bad. It did not meet trade expectations like their GDP for 2023 was plus 5.2 percent. That was on the light side. Um, some of their retail sales data was just atrocious. Um, uh, it was up 7.4 percent for the month of December year over year, but the trade was looking for eight plus percent. Um, and, you know, then we started to see some other data come through. It wasn't all bad, but the headline stuff that the trade really cares about, it was pretty rough. And I just thought to myself, it's going to be hard for the beans to lead this trade back higher at this point, given the USDA report numbers and given this Chinese data. So I was curious when I got up this morning to see what was going on. And I, to me, that's what Wednesday was about. It was about wheat and corn having gone through the Friday lows from the report day uh, earlier in the week, wanting to try and claw back above those lows with some good demand coming through in the wheat uh, in terms of tenders. Um, but then the soybeans just said, no, we're not going to do that. We got to keep going lower because not only Brazil price is still in the tank, um, we're really worried about the Chinese demand. Let's break this down a little bit, and uh, I'm glad that you brought in some of these uh, Chinese economic uh, news and data here today. It's going to be part of our discussion as we look at your analysis, and I think we got a couple legs of a stool here, uh, but of course, China being the big discussion point, and of course, uh, let's start with South American weather. You know, we've been seeing a lot of soybeans move from Brazil to China. That's changed up some of the dynamic here, but to your points, uh, we got a lot of weather that we're watching in South America. So uh, let's just start here and set up this piece of the picture first, Mike. Yeah, the big thing in this this map shows is the corn area of, of production in Brazil. And, and you see the big green blob in the upper left-hand corner. That's Mato Grosso. You're talking about 30 40% of the Brazilian corn production. So I took that overlay and, and used uh, an evaporative stress index that I like to use when modeling my yields for other countries and, and in the United States, and also you know trying to model for a production number, um, because as of last month, I was still sitting at about a 154 on soybean production for Brazil and a 118 for corn, Jesse, and and both those numbers have come down from other private sources, and I'm getting ready to look at my numbers right now. And, and a lot will depend on whether it rains next week like it's supposed to in center west Brazil, Mato Grosso, Goiás, Mato Grosso do Sul, and, and to a lesser degree, Sao Paulo. But just focusing on Mato Grosso and that big green blob and, and the amount of drought there, this is where I'm separating the corn from the beans in that I think the corn has been hurt a lot worse than the beans at this point, especially as late as second crop corn is going in and less second crop corn acres as a result of first crop beans and the drought. And, and so I think this is where I would scrutinize the report. I think there's a problem in this market that, that still is present from 2023, and that is we're not scrutinizing the Middle East and the Red Sea when it comes to crude oil. 
We're not putting in risk premium. We're not scrutinizing the USDA numbers when they took the corn numbers up so much globally, but it was all one country. It was China, you know, 14 million tons in increase in production. 12 of that came from China. And I'm sitting here thinking, how can that be when China is importing at a three year marketing year high right now? So why did USDA fall, follow along with, with China's numbers, their official numbers? So that takes me back to this map and it takes me back to the fact that I think we do have irreparable damage in this crop done that there there are many of us out there thinking that but the trade in general it's not playing that in terms of trying to price that in it's it's gotten a green light in my opinion to go lower if it wants to because of usda's numbers last friday and this poor economic data uh, that's a great uh, way to put this together here, Mike. And I want to go and and look at soy exports as well. And you mentioned, you know, China's at at, at highs here for for imports. Uh, break down this chart for us. Uh, what exactly are you seeing here right now? Yeah, the context of this chart for me, Jesse, is okay. If I'm worried about another five to eight percent lower because of China and the USDA report. Even though the Taiwanese election went smoothly, we didn't get our Santa Claus rally. We didn't get our reset on our crop report like I wanted. The market to me is returning back to 2023 in mindset. It's retrenching for poor commodity demand. And, and this is all about China for the most part. And, and part of it is the currencies, but that, that again kind of can be rolled back into China and the weakness there. But this chart kind of highlights to me, if I have to pick which commodity, if they are going to go 5 to 8% lower, fundamentally speaking on the report, and then net price and profitability, what's the best one to go after? I think it's the soybeans in terms of protecting downside, because 5 to 8% lower, an 8% lower market from $12 would be about $11 down to a futures price. And so that dollar potential is, I think, very much worth protecting. And especially in light of this chart, because what I'm looking at here, especially is the orange part of the graph. That's China's uh, imports, their demand from the United States um, in the last four years. And they just ratcheted down as they've picked up more from Brazil. Their, their actual imports total are going up. But in, in year after year, I mean, I think this is a, a, another big year for increases. I want to say it was 10 or 11 percent for Brazil in terms of China. That came at the expense of us. And so that takes us to the black line. That is where you're at in terms of percent of exports by, at the time of your marketing year versus your marketing year total. And so we should be close to 40 percent of our marketing year total at this point. Um, but we're <clears throat> really sitting and in, in back in 2020, 2021, uh, we were well north of 40, close to 45% of our total uh, and over that even. But we, we aren't even close to 40% at this stage of the game. And so I think given the fact that Brazilian beans in Paranagua are 425, 427 a ton and we're at 482, um, there's downside potential here if these Chinese markets don't come back for us. And I guess I want to ask, why would they, given their negative crush margins, given their hog situation, and given the cheaper Brazilian price? So this chart's about laying out the idea for my clients and subscribers why I want to hedge with puts if we take out Friday's lows, last Friday's report day lows and beans, the beans, and not necessarily do any corn or, or wheat. Well, and you mentioned the China economic data, and I'll pull up this chart as well, looking at their CPI. And I, I, you know, I guess the question I maybe have here with China as well, you mentioned they're importing a lot right now. I've heard a lot of talk, though, about their economy being in poor shape. I, I just wonder, are they stockpiling for the potential of their economy, you know, going in the tank possibly here, Mike? I, I guess I wonder about that. Yeah, this is one of the big things in 2024 and why I still feel like we may be cutting into a demand low here right now with these markets doing what they're doing because the trades, I think, getting bad signals right now or getting mixed signals. And th this chart specifically shows us very clearly that the GDP deflator, the essentially the inflationary gauge that economists use for countries to measure their deflation um, is at the worst in terms of out, outright number 
um, at a negative 1.4%. That's going to be your green line on the left-hand side scale. You're at a negative 1.4%. That's the worst since 2009 in the financial crisis. And if you look at how many quarters and how long we've been in the negative on that green line, it's as bad as it was than when we go all the way back to 1999 before China even joined the WTO. This is the heart of the commodity bull in, in terms of it being resuscitated or not. And you can see real clearly that that Chinese food CPI, consumer price inflation data, really tracks big time with that GDP defl deflator and vice versa. And so when you see those kind of numbers, it doesn't matter right now that 2023's coal output by China was a record. It doesn't matter that their crude imports were up 11% and a record. It doesn't matter that their soybean imports were up 11% as well, and that their pork output, uh, output was the highest in 10 years, and that their refinery output was the highest on record. I mean, all this data is just pretty fresh in the market, but they're not looking at it because of this chart and a couple other pieces of information, I think. We are talking today with Mike Zuzalo from Global Commodity Analytics, breaking down the markets and the market action that we have currently. And Mike, let's continue uh, on this discussion here with the China aspect here in these markets and look at another chart, looking at the Chinese yuan and just what are you seeing here in terms of their monetary values and just this economy as well? Break this chart down for us, too, because I, I find all this very fascinating, Mike. They can't they can't lower their interest rates at the Bank of China because their currency keeps weakening because of their economic data and the investment world is not putting foreign money into their country. This offshore currency for the Chinese yuan Jesse, is at a nine to 10 week low now against the US dollar. So that means their buying power is going down. This type of currency move in China gets spilled over into countries like Brazil. Brazil just had a five week low posted against the US dollar today. So not only does Brazil get more competitive on their exports, but we get less competitive on our exports because China's buying power in against the US dollar gets weaker and weaker. And I think this is how we kind of roll the cigar to get the layers we need. I think that this is the facets in the diamond as to why this stuff is so important to the farmer and to the rancher. And this is all going on in the midst of Tunisia, Jordan, Algeria, and Egypt, all tendering for wheat about 1.6 million metric tons in the last four or five days. And you got to think, well, if they're doing that, then they must feel like the low in wheat is in. And so that's the contrast that I see right now when I look at this chart versus, say, the wheat market right now. One other chart to help kind of tie all these thoughts together on China, a monthly uh, soybean chart. Uh, what are you seeing here? Let's kind of button up uh, our, our China discussion today and try to summarize this for folks listening in here. Great stuff so far, but how can we kind of button up this conversation? What should folks take take to heart and keep in mind here, Mike? Yeah, two things. This is 50 years of data on soybean lead month futures, and you've got one more low left after Friday's report, and that's about 1170, and that takes you back to the 2020-2021 time period. I don't want to wait for that low to be violated. I, I'm going to go after this market if we take out Friday's report day lows any time this week and get those May puts bought in the soybeans because of the orange line, because there is really no support that you can see technically speaking in that chart until you get down to the long-term trend that is drawn off of, guess what, the 2000, 2001 time period. So when traders and analysts and commodities are, I'm a contrarian right now, thinking that we don't need to go to 2015 to 2019 price levels again. But when they talk about this, that's why they're saying that is because you've got some real downside, technically speaking, on some of these long-term charts. The last thing I'll say about this chart is the very bottom right corner is a stochastic. It's an oscillator. It's a sentiment indicator that I like to use. And it's very oversold, which means there should be fewer and fewer new sellers 
coming into this into the market. But when you're talking about something so big as China, Jesse, I don't think you can rely too heavily upon that. And, and kind of to cushion myself, that's why I'm doing the bought puts and I'm not selling a lot of cash bushels here. I'd rather start with the puts and see if this is a quote false breakout to the downside. And then if my puts don't work, I've still got plenty of cash to help offset that potential put loss. Any differences for you two? One more thought in grains uh, between old crop versus new crop marketing at this juncture post USDA report. Are there are there many major differences for you right now, Mike? Yeah, I think the thing that for me is, is that we still need the acres in both corn and beans, less so in the beans because we're now at a 280 million bushel carryover. But to me, Jesse, that 280 million bushel carryover, if, if it's really there, I don't see much daylight in the cash basis for soybeans until we get closer to April when Brazil should theoretically run out. But this all goes right back to the whole idea of how big is the Brazilian crop and how big is the Argentine crop to offset the Brazilian crop. So I, I see more um, volatility in the old crop and, and especially in the basis side of the equation than maybe the new crop. All right, let's talk livestock a little bit here before we wrap up today's program. Uh, look at one more chart. Look at the cattle hog spread. Uh, what are you seeing right now? What are the dynamics in these uh, livestock markets in the protein sector here post WASDE report for you, Mike? Well, this chart to me is very important because I, I do think we're still running kind of a 2015 model year. And last year was like 2014. And this chart kind of helps show some similarities as far as the price action in cattle versus hogs. Uh, and we've gotten some pretty negative data from China when it comes to their top three hog producers. And so it would make sense to me that the cattle chart would hold up, that trend line would hold up against the hogs. In other words, we wouldn't need to go below $100 premium on a weekly basis in lead month cattle minus lead month hogs. If we would, I would probably take that as a sell signal in the cattle. And that kind of wraps up with this week's cattle on feed and, and the placements numbers and the on feed numbers. And it kind of wraps well with this weather market that really never materialized in, in terms of the plain states. It was supportive, but I don't think we really put any premium on this market, especially given that the USDA's fed cattle comprehensive report yesterday for the week showed us up about a dollar on steers and we're upwards of 175.70 now. So we should have a pretty easy path to higher cattle prices in the short term, if you ask me. I, I know, too. I've been watching uh, the cutouts, uh, both choice and select on the cattle side. have been creeping back up there towards uh, some lofty levels again, Mike. Anything you can draw from some of that activity as well here to watch for in these markets? Yeah, and I, th I think that is one of the biggest features to this weather and what it's done to the packer and shutting in packers and not being able to get uh, market-ready steers to the to the packer and, and really tighten us up. But the trade in the futures market, I've heard them say, well, that's not that positive because you're backing up supplies. That just means heavier dress weights. We just can't get away from those big weights right now in terms of the trade psychology. So I historically, I think that when you have weather like this, it's net net a positive for prices because at some point you're probably going to have a hole in marketings and you're also going to have a lot lighter weights if it keeps up. But that's where next week's weather for South America and their production and next week's weather for us to be able to warm up again, they're pretty big deals if you ask me in the big, in the big scheme of things, Jesse. Hogs, too. Uh, one thought from you there. We've been trying to churn this market higher. I, I feel like we maybe hit a little bit of overhead resistance here the last few days, Mike. I think we have, and I don't like the new Chinese data. The three biggest hog producers out there in China have pretty much held on with bigger numbers until just right now. They tried to ride the bad times out, but their, their cash flows are just getting eaten up. And so they are still in the midst of liquidation from what I can tell. So the hogs need cattle at this point, in my opinion. Well, great analysis. Uh, I know we took a, a deep dive into uh, the soy market here, especially today, but always uh, appreciate the conversation. And Mike, if folks want to reach out to you with questions, take a look at your research and more, how can they get a hold of you, Mike? 
Best ways to go to globalcomresearch.com, Jesse. It's globalcom with two M's, research.com. And I'll be doing a report to clients and subscribers. So please sign up for the uh, for the analysis and be part of that uh, analysis on this soybean hedge recommendation, which will include some uh, put uh, projected profit loss charts that I like to do. Globalcom with two M's, research.com. That's where you could find more from Mike Zuzalo with Global Commodity Analytics. Mike, Always a pleasure. Thanks for joining us. Have a great week. We'll talk to you next week. Thanks, Jesse. Appreciate you helping me explain all this. You do a great job. Uh, well, I, I do the best that I can some days, Mike. But uh, thank you as always and uh, appreciate your insight. Mike Zuzalo with Global Commodity Analytics joining us here today on Market Talk. We're out of time. Find us at markettalkag.com. I'm Jesse Allen. Have a great afternoon.